I want to thank you all for staying, and if you're um, just coming in, welcome. Uh, welcome to the second session of the Peekskill NAACP Candidates Forum for the primary elections. Um, just a couple quick notes. Um, we are, if you're all, we're already here and you need new question cards, uh, please just raise your hand and uh, we will have someone um, deliver you um, a new question cards. Um, if you already have them, remember to write your questions, raise your hands when you're ready to um, uh, give in the questions and we will get them to the moderator for you. Um, so at, without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Wilbur Aldridge, who is the regional director of the Peak Seal of the Westchester NAACP, um, and um, he'll moderate the event um, starting now. So thank you and welcome everyone. Good afternoon. I want to go over the uh, questions again, um, the questions, the rules again, so that uh, everyone is fully aware. I know there are some people who may not have been here at the beginning of the last session, or yeah, the other last section. You see, I'm losing it here already. Um, okay, each candidate will in turn be asked questions from the uh, predetermined list of questions, as well as questions that the audience can submit by just filling out the card that you've been given, raise the card up, and someone will come and get the card, and they will then deliver the cards over here. And those questions from the audience will take priority over the predetermined question, so that we will be ans asking some of the things and focusing on some of your concerns. Um, the candidates will be given a time frame to answer the questions. Most of the time it will be two minutes. Uh, if indeed a candidate does not get in all the information or they choose to pontificate on the question and not be specific in their answers, at the end of that two minutes, they will be stopped. Um, whether you get it in or not, that's solely up to you. So figure out the most important things and get that to the people who came here to hear what you had to say. The audience will not do any direct comments or questions or statements to the candidates. They will all come through the individuals in the back by when you write your uh, questions on the, on, the, on the card. Do not write statements because the statements will not be considered. It must be in the form of a question. The Peak Skill NACP has developed predetermined questions based on the game changers that is mandated by the national office and the national board of the NAACP. Previously, the candidate received five specific questions to be answered in writing so that they may be handed out to the audience at the end of the forum, and I believe that's what will happen in this particular instance. Right, guys? Yes, okay, so you will get those questions that they were given previously. They are not the quest same questions that I will be asking from here, okay? Any questions of anybody before we start so that we can get into this and really have a dialogue with these two candidates? Gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, you have heard the rules. Do you have any questions? I do not. Okay. Nope. No questions, Mr. Nope. Latimer, either? Okay. Now, let me start with each one of you taking, we'll give you two minutes to introduce yourself and state why you are running for the elected office. Remember, two minutes. We'll start with uh, Mr. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, I'm going through. We will start with Mr. Jenkins. You won the coin flip. <laughs> In my head. <laughs> uh, that's exactly where it was. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you, Peekskill and ACP, for having this opportunity, and, and certainly Regional Director Aldridge and all the members that are here from the different branches around the county. My name is Ken Jenkins. I'm running to be county executive. Um, for those of you that don't know, my, my mom was a nurse, my dad was a cop, and, and I grew up in 
an environment where we believed in service. And, and certainly as a, a past president of the, the Yonkers NACP, I am certainly understanding with our forum that we have in this afternoon's opportunity. Um, I've been a manager in the technology field for over 20 years. I've been involved in our human and civil rights struggle for over 25 years. I will tell you that we can't do the same things that we did in 2013 and on 2009 and expect the same results. We have to definitely change the game in 2017. You know, I've been involved in doing so many things and looking at a record of real results for the people of Westchester County. And whether those results have been in legislation which I've led, information that I've just sponsored, got through a board of legislation, legisl legislators that could be sometime divided, I will tell you that we have a lot of opportunity in this year. We have a chance to make a difference. We have a chance to make history. But more importantly, we have a chance to change the trajectory of Westchester County. I've been involved with Rob Astorino since he's been the county executive. There is no one that has more experience in dealing with him on a daily day basis because I have to live with him from a day to day basis. I've seen every bad deal. I've seen the fiscal mismanagement and I know the opportunities that we have to make a difference. So I'm looking forward to working with you this afternoon and listening to the questions and expecting that we'll have a great afternoon. So thank you so much. Mr. Latimer. Hi, I'm George Latimer, and uh, I'm running for Westchester County Executive. I'm a boy from the south side of Mount Vernon, South 14th Avenue. I grew up and went to Mount Vernon Public Schools and a graduate of Mount Vernon High School. My dad, Stan, was a maintenance man at Beach Point Club in Mamaroneck, and my mom was a factory worker, worked at various factories along McQuestion Parkway and South Street. I grew up in a neighborhood where we were the only white family, and we were the only white family because my mom and dad did not move from the south side of Mount Vernon when white flight hit in the early 1960s. And for that, I will always remember my mom and my dad with a very special remembrance. <clears throat> I've served in business for a number of years in sales and marketing for some major corporations, subsidiary of Nestle and ITT, and I've been in public office at different levels of government. I've been an elected councilman in my home community now of Rice City. I was on the county legislature for 13 years. I won a seat that was never held by a Democrat before I won it. And I became the first Democratic chairman of the county legislature, preceding uh, a number of other fine chairmen, including Ken, who succeeded me thereafter. I've served and served now in the, in the New York State Senate, and I've served in both houses of the state legislature, and I think that experience is important. When you run Westchester County, you need relationships in Albany. You can certainly criticize the way it's operated. There's nothing about Albany that uh, is wonderful and pleasant, but you need somebody who can walk in, get the meetings that are necessary, have the relations necessary to move policy. I'm a strong supporter of Andrea Stewart Cousins in the Senate Democratic Conference, and what that means is I'm part of the progressive Democrats. You need to say that because there's a question about, you know, which Democrat is which kind of a Democrat uh, in Albany and elsewhere. I ran, I'm running for this office, and I'm not running against Ken. We are two individuals in a sprint. One of us is going to win the sprint on Tuesday, and uh, I've said, and he said, that we're fully supportive of the other one. If he wins on Tuesday night, I'm with him 100% money, support, whatever's necessary. Because the real problem here is the way Rob Astorino has run this county. I, I have seen his mismanagement of finances, his mismanagement of social policy, and we'll talk about more of that in detail as you ask your questions. Thank you. Let me ask, uh, what, would you, what do you plan to do to increase affordable and non-discriminatory housing for Westchester residents. And we'll start with Mr. Latimer. Thanks. The, uh, the shameful way that uh, Westchester County under Rob has handled the HUD settlement issue is an example of how Westchester has been tagged as a place that uh, does not want to do its fair share in terms of housing. We, during my tenure in the county government and now in the state government through the financing mechanisms of uh, housing communities renewal, we've supported any number of uh, housing projects and we're not even close to the amount of affordable housing we need. There are communities like Peekskill, like Mamaroneck Village, like White Plains and Port Chester and Mount Vernon that have done their fair share, and there are other communities that had not done their fair share, and what the housing settlement did do is it made communities like Larchmont and Rye and other ones come to the table 
and get projects done in their area. And uh, we're going to need to go forward because we need a lot more than the 750. We need thousands more. And they need to be uh, low density. They need to be spread out. They need to be livable environments for people to have a decent opportunity and a decent life to go forward. We have to be site specific. We have to look at the land that's available and be as creative as we can. We're going to need financing from the state, and I believe that'll be there. We need financing from the federal government under Donald Trump. I don't think it's going to be there because Donald Trump and Rob Astorino jointly did this deal to call it vindication. What vindication it is, I don't know. We lost $35 million in federal aid, both to CDBG, Community Development Block Grant Funds, and also home funds over the course of the five years that uh, Westchester was not in compliance. But whatever vindication it is, we're going to have to fight to get those federal money, and it's not going to be easy <clears throat> because the philosophy of the Republican Party is not to do these things. They, their philosophy is pretty much you're on your own, son, and uh, that, that philosophy does not work for people in need. So I think we have a continuing commitment for affordable housing. We're going to have to work hard and be creative to get the money, to find the sites, and in some cases to overcome the political opposition that exists. But my record has proven that over an extended period of time. We just, just yesterday opened up a 10-unit facility in Armonk. Armonk's an upscale community, opened up 10 units of affordable housing with state and county money, and we need to do that times 100, times 1,000. Okay, Mr. Jenkins, same question. So what Westchester County needs to do is first reinvest in all of the communities as far as the, the dollars that we have for infrastructure, whether it's acquisition funds or the, uh, the infrastructure funds or the acquisition funds for the, the county. Under Rob Astorino, those have gone away. So we have approximately a Westchester um, Affordable Housing Coalition and Westchester Affordable Housing Commission that is requiring almost 25,000 units of fair and affordable housing to be developed over the period of Westchester County in the next five years. We need to work with our planning departments, with the local municipalities, and come up with municipality-specific plans, making sure that it takes care of public transportation, livable communities, and making sure that we are working with developers. The majority of developers now don't use federal dollars. They use a combination of state and county dollars to do those acquisition and in pilot agreements. We need to work with those communities as a whole, as a county, and providing that service that we can provide from regional government to make sure that we can help assist those communities as we move forward in providing housing for everyone, and whether that's for folks that are, um, that are different abilities or disabilities, or whether they're for our public employees, our public works folks, our public school teachers, and all those kind of folks that provide services, we need to make sure that we have that fair and affordable housing together. And as county executive, I would make sure that we're working with our municipal officials associations and working with those local municipalities to come up with those things and continue the incentives. We have several incentives right now in Westchester County to create affordable housing. And whether it's creating open space through our legacy funds or, again, through those two main sources of funding that we have through New Homes Land Acquisition and Housing Infrastructure Fund. But we need to do that, but we need to do that together. And whether or not the federal government is going to participate in those where it's going to be public housing, we're going to work together with the local municipalities to make sure that we're delivering for everybody in Westchester County. And again, the number is around 25,000 units, so the housing stipulation order was trying to set up a framework to make sure that things could work. Thank you. <laughs> question, uh, this question would be for both of you. How would you work with local communities to ensure equal access to resources that enable commercial development? And we will start with uh, Mr. Latimer. Well, when we're working with local governments, it depends, obviously, if they have their own industrial development agency or not, and what their current focus has been in terms of development. <clears throat> From a county standpoint, we have certain incentives that we can deal with. There's certain sticks and carrots that a county government has that they can work with. And you start out, I think, by trying to find common ground. In theory, each local government would want to see economic development occur. I think one of the problems we have is that when we talk on a countywide basis about economic development, so much of the debate seems to be about major corporations on the 287 corridor or uh, those corporations perhaps being in some of the major office parks that uh, are off that corridor on 684 and elsewhere. The real economic development we need are in places like where I grew up, south side of Mount Vernon, where you had blue collar factories that uh, employed people who were not uh, corporate executives, but their skill set employed their family and fed their family, and those businesses don't exist to the same degree anymore. Not in parts of Yonkers, not in parts of New Rochelle, not in parts of Peekskill, not in parts of uh, uh, Sleepy Hollow and other places like that. 
We have, uh, I think, at the county level currently, we've lost our focus in that area. We're, we're much more concerned than the Rob Astorino administration about cutting a ribbon on a fancy big corporate office building and having the prestige of a corporation of a certain size come in, not necessarily knowing if that's going to employ people in Westchester, and particularly those people that suffer from high unemployment records. That certainly includes people of color. It certainly includes uh, young men. Uh, and it certainly includes those who may have uh, run afoul of the law early in their life and have developed uh, a record which, uh, unfortunately, defines who they are in every way, shape, or form when it comes time for employment. So I think the county government can take an aggressive role, cooperative role, with those local governments, depending on each different government. And, and again, we have different communities that are very different in style. There's Peekskill and there's North Salem. They're both local governments, completely different. But we try to use the same tool set of, uh, inside, uh, uh, of carrots and sticks to try to accomplish a greater degree of growth, site by site by site. Okay, Mr. Jenkins. Thank you. So for county economic development, I had the experience of being the, the CEO president of the Yonkers IDA, Industrial Development Agency. And in combination with that and understanding how the county can provide regional services, and it should provide those regional services to all the communities. And now you have a, a toolkit, a blueprint, where you can utilize for each community as they see fit. And utilizing the county resources to make sure that we can have those investments around the county where they're needed and where we can tweak based on local need. So for example, when we have an employment opportunity um, for Westchester County, the plan that I put forward, the 12 point um, plan for minority and women business enterprises for Westchester County is a way that we can make sure that we have local businesses involved in the, the huge amount of development that we have going on in Westchester County. And we need to do some repurposing because we have a lot of places and so many places in my home city of Yonkers, um, we have so much retail base that when something happens, we have a lot of people catching a cold because we don't have the sales tax coming in because we don't have the retail businesses and we don't have the employment opportunities. Every business in Westchester County, no matter large or small, knows it's important and we can be able to do livable and retrainable communities. So if we take and repurpose an office park and create fair and affordable housing and we make it its uses to be more than just nine to five, Monday through Friday, then we can help invigorate the community. But we have to do that by working with the local municipalities and we can't do things like with the tax giveaways with the industrial development agencies. One of my records as the industrial development agency president, the first thing I did was create a baseline dollar amount that it would, the, the tax breaks would go up no matter what. Because it would be great if we all could get the same benefits that companies do when they say they're going to bring businesses, and they really do bring those businesses to the community. We need to continue to do those kind of partnerships with local municipalities so that there's not poaching going on inside of Westchester County to make sure that we have development going on countywide. OK, I'm going to move to a question that will deal with health care, which is one of the priorities within the NAACP. What role do you think county government can play to safeguard the health of Westchester residents? And we'll start with Mr. Jenkins. Well, it's a requirement for Westchester County um, under state law to provide health care services at a specific level, and whether those are mental health services or community-based health services. Under Rob Astorino, one of the things that we fought for in one of the 260 overrides that we did on the Board of Legislators was putting money back into our not-for-profit partners and neighborhood health centers that provide valuable services for all of Westchester County. And we were able to utilize those services through our neighborhood health center, um, services and health centers to do things like disease control with like flu vaccinations and making sure that we could do things quickly. Now, under this administration, we can't do that. Um, and Rob Astorino has cut those particular funds down to the bone, so they eliminated them completely. And now we don't have that sort of partners to help provide services in the community. Neighborhood health centers came up because of the county when they were being um, moved together to be able to provide those services on a more local basis because that's what county government should be, a regional support for all the local municipalities and helping people to save money overall, the local governments 
and the state government as a, a, as a extension of the state and federal government because we're the ones that are closest to it. So we have a great opportunity in that. In the 800 not-for-profit partners renders that work for Westchester County, the not-for-profit partners that we have provide services in so many ways to so many different people, and those are the ways that we help influence our health care policy and make sure that there's access for everyone. And again, under Rob Astorino, those things have rolled backwards and been eliminated, and we have service providers that cannot provide those services that the way that they need to. Under my administration, we would implement one of the pieces of legislation I put forward where um, our not-for-profit partners would not have to come back every year to come back and sing for money, that they would be part of the county budget and managed by the individual departments that were responsible for them. Thank you. Mr. Latimer. I think we have to go in first with our philosophy. I was uh, in front of uh, a place in New Rochelle earlier this morning greeting voters. Two individuals walked by me and they said, cut my taxes. Both of them said the same phrase about 15, 20 minutes apart. And that's what Rob Astorino has created in Westchester County. He's created a discussion that pivots on one issue, cut my taxes. Not all of the different services that we are required to provide as a county government in harmony with the state and a federal government. I believe that, that health care is exactly like education. It is a societal requirement that we, respond, we provide that opportunity for everybody on an equal basis. Now, the county can't implement a, a single payer system. I support that legislation as a member of the state legislature. But the bottom line is that the county has a role to play. But we have to change the discussion about health care. Health care is not about something that you get to the degree that you can afford it. As, as in the same way you look at education, you don't say you can afford good education for your kid, that's, that's the amount of education they get. The same is true for health care. Now, at the county level, there are a number of departments that interact with the health care issue. Department of Health has an education component to health care. Mental health, certainly for people with special uh, needs and services. Department of Social Services, throughout the course of the services they provide, uh, include uh, that which is funded through programs. And in every one of those departments, Rob Astorino has cut staff, and he's reduced the level of ability to deliver that service. And he's done that philosophically. He's done that ideologically. It's not because he's stupid, and it's not because he wants uh, to deal with a uh, budget crisis that he inherited. He's created the budget crisis by saying that the standard that we're going to hold to now is there's never ever going to be a dime more of spending from year one to year two, no matter what the needs are. As Ken properly pointed out, when I was chairman of the board, we funded the Hudson Valley Healthcare, the Greenberg Neighborhood Health Center, Open Door and Austin and the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Healthcare. This administration has cut those programs. So the simple answer, as I have four seconds left, is we will get back to the standard we used to have in Westchester County to make sure the county is involved in good health for everybody in this county. Thank you. In light of the man in the White House <laughs> recent decision on the DREAM Act, how would you intend to protect the dreamers in our immigrant community? Uh, start with <laughs> start with Mr. Jenkins. All right. Um, well, first we would take a step back and we would make sure to, to have enacted the Immigration Protection Act. And I'm expecting that the Board of Legislators we're going to go back and um, override that that veto and work on that one Republican we need to see the light um, on the September 25th meeting. But if that didn't happen, when, as soon as I became county executive, that would be one of the first things I would work with my partners on the Board of Legislators to move forward with, was making sure that we had an Immigration Protection Act which set forth the policy on how we interact with the federal government. Once we had that in place, dealing with um, the DREAMers and, and dealing with DACA becomes a, an issue that falls in line with the way that we work inside of Westchester County. No one in Westchester County should be afraid to come forward and talk about different pieces of information. Uh, no one should be talking about, um, afraid to let us know that they're being taken advantage of by people in the community, in their housing needs, because they might be undocumented and they're getting um, jerked around as far as their rent is concerned. No one should be afraid to move forward and let us know that there's violence that's happening in the community and, or that they're victims of 
domestic violence. And one of the examples I like to give on how I work, and even not as a state legislator, working with our state legislator to make legislators to make sure that there's differences. We had a pro program in Westchester County that was funding our domestic violence shelters. And part of the federal law requires, and the state law required as well, and the county followed, that we would not spend any money on folks that were undocumented. Well, the not-for-profit partners, Hope's Door and my sister's place, were not getting reimbursed for that. So those were called uncompensated stays. And because they were living on a shoestring budget, that was a significant issue. So as a county legislator, I worked with my colleagues in the state legislature to allow us to spend our money because it's a 50-50 match. And we were able to achieve that. So Westchester County can spend its money in protecting domestic violence victims and making sure that those shelters get their funding. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Latimer. As a state legislator, I'm a co-sponsor of the State Dream Act, and I voted for the Dream Act when it came to the floor of the Senate. It has passed the Assembly. It's failed to pass the Senate because of the opposition of the Republican Party. And uh, just as we've seen a Republican president uh, uh, make plans to uh, eliminate DACA. We've seen uh, disagreement with uh, the way we deal with immigrants as our brothers and sisters. Uh, I think there's a pretty clear ideological difference. There's no real difference uh, amongst us Democrats, but as soon as the primary is over and we face off against Rob Astorino, there'll be a sharp difference, and we're going to have to make a very strong and persuasive case. Now, I saw this week where Steve Bannon decided to take on the Catholic bishops and try to redefine what Jesus Christ said about uh, the stranger in your midst. And uh, there are times when religion speaks to our values and different uh, denominations have different disagreements on policy. But in this case, we're on the side of the angels. Those of us who believe, as Ken and I and the, most of the people in this room do believe, that whatever your country of origin is, there's no such thing as an illegal human being. You're a human being here on the same planet, whatever the color of your skin, whatever your country of origin is. Uh, I would hope that the Board of Legislators would override the Immigration Protection Act, uh, and, I, and I know that the Democrats on the board, I think there are two Republicans as well, are committed to doing that, that's a good thing. If they find that third Republican, great, and it's done. If it isn't done, then uh, in the first week uh, of my tenure as a county executive, I would pass an executive order implementing it with the authority to do that to the county police and the county uh, corrections facilities and so forth. And then I would invite the Board of Legislators to act as legislators, then come back with a law that would protect greater than an executive order does. You've seen how uh, Trump has reversed all of President Obama's executive orders. So an executive order is not enough, but an executive order is immediate, and it can accomplish the immediate situation. I've spoken with police chiefs in some communities with their high uh, immigrant population, and, and they don't want to get in a public battle with a county executive. But they've told me privately that, that this direction is crazy. You need to have community policing, relationship between the police and the people who live there. And if you're afraid and you see domestic violence or criminal action in the street, you're not going to go to the police and tell them if you think that your own situation or your loved one's going to be drawn into question. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to move to a question pertaining to uh, diversity. What would you do to propose, what would you propose to do to increase the diversity in county offices, non-elected positions, starting with Mr. Latimer? Well, I'm going to do the same thing that I did when I became uh, chairman of the Board of Legislators. As the first Democrat, my predecessor was a Republican, and uh, he had hired a certain number of discretionary positions. Uh, and, and the Board of Legislators had a very small population of diversity, very few people of color, very few folks who were either uh, African American or Latino or, for that matter, Asian American. And during that period of time, I made it a point of changing the demographics with talented, qualified people. We made outreach. We made outreach to the organizations of the day, including uh, some of the local uh, Democratic organizations, the Black Democrats, the uh, Hispanic Democrats, and asked them, please, give us uh, resumes of qualified uh, individuals so that we could hire talented people who brought diversity to the table, not just to hit some magic numbers on a chart, but because you're dealing with a diverse population of people and you want the people that are uh, working to administer our plans to reflect the nature of the people that they're serving and understand the cultural realities of the people they're serving. So that's exactly what we did 
back in uh, 1998 when I took over the Board of Legislators. That's exactly what I would do again in 2018, 20 years later, uh, with Westchester County government. And I know, because if I've traveled the county, I've seen many talented people that have been shut out of being considered for county government because uh, they didn't uh, you know, pay for play or they didn't do the right thing. We're not going to have those kind of standards. We're going to look for talent wherever we may find it. And it's all out there. It's waiting for us to look for it and to reach out to and, and to attract them into the public service of what we have. I'd say one final thing about all of this. I think sometimes that uh, we don't really appreciate what, what a wrong direction has occurred under Rob Astorino, because there were Republican county executives before him that understood diversity, as there were certainly Democratic executives that did. It's Rob Astorino uniquely breaking tradition from Westchester County to put around him a small cadre of people who don't reflect that diversity. And uh, I'm sure he wants to run for governor to do the same thing in the state that he's done in Westchester County. I think we have to make a commitment that it stops right here, right now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. And on the Board of Legislators, what we did um, is ask for, first, the reporting, so that you would be able to see from every different level of our county government, no matter which level it was, whether it was the non-managerial ranks or whether it was the, the union ranks, what the diversity of each position was. After we got that information, then we set forth a plan to say, all right, now that you're aware of this situation, now what do we need to do about it to make sure that we're recruiting and retaining people that go up the line, not just at the lower levels, but across the board? Because the, the, the jobs that are in the tested area don't seem to have the same issues that the appointed positions do. And we certainly pointed that out to Rob Astorino along the way, when there was no one no one of diverse means, whether it was by ethnicity or gender, that was working on the ninth floor of the county, of, of the county office building. So once we pointed that out, there was a, a move afoot to make some modifications, but not quite frankly the way that we need to do across the board. We need to have Westchester County be a, a place where you look and you can see the diverse nature of everyone in Westchester County. We need to make sure that there's representation. I will bring back the offices of diversity that we used to have under, uh, under Andy Spano, which represented both Hispanic, African American, LGBTQ, and all the other Asian Americans, and including our, a Muslim American community as well. So we did all of those things under Andy Spano that all went away. And they only come back now when they're done for a photo op or whether they're done to try to suggest that there's action taking place. If you don't have those things happening, then you have an issue. That's why I presented in my candidacy that Minority and Women Business Enterprise Program that has a 12-point program that takes care of making sure that all of our diversity and all of our experience can be taken care of, both for men and women, big businesses and small. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move to one of our game changers, which is criminal justice. We all are aware that racial profiling exists. We don't seem to be able to get a handle on eradicating it. What would you do as county executive to ensure in the county of Westchester the racial profiling becomes non-existent? And we will start with uh, Mr. Jenkins. So we have a report right now that's required by the county law that we do not get, which shows the, um, which shows the breakdown of people that are stopped by the county police and the arrest, so by gender and by race. So we are able to see that. We used to be able to see that. It's actually a county law that, quite frankly, the Board of Legislators and the bipartisan po coalition of, um, of the Board of Legislators doesn't insist upon. It's a law. We would get it from the county, so we would have that as a public record so everyone would be able to see what things are happening. And again, awareness is half the battle. Once people are aware, now you can make people accountable. And in our county police department, um, the, the uh, commissioner and the highest ranking officers don't reflect all the diversity of Westchester County. We have to make those changes. And when you have a racial profiling report, and we have great professionals that work in our county police department, and that's why we were able to get that report through other means. But the fact is that we don't, if you don't have the diversity in leadership, and you don't have people from different communities giving that input, we have issues. We have a human rights commission 
that we have in Westchester County that's been completely decimated. Right? Rob Astorito tried to close it a few times, which people forgot. There's no executive director right now. It's the, sec the first deputy county attorney that sits in that position. If you don't have that happening, there's nowhere to make complaints for, for Westchester County. You're saying what you really mean and what you really feel about diversity. We will bring all of that back. And as a legislator, we were able to take um, you know, Andrea Stewart Cousins' legislation that, that George Latimer was chair of the board that got through as chair of the board that I actually spoke on in the county center, that we would make sure to change it and we increase the diversity by including transgender folks and by giving people a chance to go to different venues to make their complaints. Thank you. Mr. Latimer. You know, uh, I'll pick up where Ken left off. It is, it is absolutely heartbreaking to those of us who served on the County Board of Legislators in our day. Andrea Stewart Cousins uh, and Lois Bronze's uh, idea that uh, became the Human Rights Commission. That was groundbreaking in its day. Other things have happened since then that have advanced the issue beyond that. I, my responsibility as chairman of the board in that day was to get it passed, get it through the legislative uh, uh, labyrinth and we had difficulty but we wound up with a bipartisan support different kind of Republican in those days I might say as well uh, I had to deal directly with the Archdiocese of New York to make sure that they didn't oppose it on the pulpits and that last weekend before our vote came up that week and that was difficult negotiations we got through it the law got passed and we were excited and we had Allison Green and Dolores Braithwaite as executive directors who fulfilled the mission and now it's been devastated as Ken has as uh, outlined and the reinstitution of that, the firing of everybody involved with it today, and the hiring of a whole new group of people will be one of the most gratifying moments that I'll have. And if Ken is county executive, I'm going to have a gratifying moment when he does it, because one of us is going to do it if one of us is your county executive. <laughs> Let me also say in the original question that you asked, I think it comes down to the people you hire and the direction you give them. My experience in corporate life involved having responsibility to people above me in the structure and people below me in a structure that had authority to me. And when I was given a direct order, I understood that I was required to respond on along the lines that my superior expected. And the people that reported to me had the same expectation. And there were sanctions if you didn't do it. I don't think all of this is that hard. I think you get a uh, commissioner of public safety who understands that the policy of the next government under a democratic executive is to make sure that every person of color and every person of any background is treated with respect at any point in time that they're being interacted with with the police, the county police department. And the same applies in the correctional facilities. There are rules and regulations that exist. Uh, you know, we may need some more rules and regulations, but what we need most of all is we need people to understand that's what we're incentivizing. I think the average person who works for the county, the average police officer who works for the county police is doing what they're told. And if they're being told, listen, man, our philosophy is go after people because that's our philosophy, uh, I think that changes with a different philosophy at the top. New people hired, clear direction from the county executive, let the board of legislators do the job of oversight of the executive branch, and you do those things, and things will get better. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> this question will be for both of you. Do you or would you support a bill addressing prosecution prosecutorial conduct, why and why not, or why not? Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Latimer. Well, at this point in Westchester, because there's a debate about that at the state level as to whether that's appropriate or not. At the county level, I don't know that that's necessary. I think we have in uh, Tony Scarpino as the new district attorney, uh, a very uh, reasonable, workable guy. I happened to go to high school with him in Mount Vernon High School, so I've known him for almost all of my life. Uh, and I think at this point, the, uh, the, the need for legislation to do this in Westchester County is more likely needed when there are incidents that point to the necessity for that, where there has failed to be proper prosecution. Right now, the governor has a program by which the state attorney general steps in and overrides the local district attorney if the district attorney has not prosecuted properly or fairly. At a state level, there's a legitimate debate to be had for that. But uh, as I said, if, if the mission here for a county executive is to function and go forward, I would, I would like to see us work with the uh, prosecutorial arm of the county. Uh, I believe that they'll do a good job under Tony Scarpino, and I believe that uh, we'll be able to see fairness uh, adjudicated. But if we have a reason to think that that isn't the case over time, then I think we reserve the right to do whatever we have to do there legislatively. 
Mr. Jenkins. And, and the, the, the core issue, and again, because of the experience that I have um, from one, my father being a cop, two, being the president of NACP, and three, being just a human rights activist for over 25 years, I understand the issue starts with confidence in the, the ability for the prosecution of the police and of other authorities to police themselves. And that doesn't start when something happens. Right? The, real, the real work that we need to do is to continue to have those open dialogues now before something happens. So in our case, we may or may not need that prosecutorial office. But right now, the understanding from so many people is they don't have confidence in the, the process that it's gonna be fair and equitable. And if we need something outside to address that, that as a county executive is what I would expect to lead, to be able to say, our communities are having an issue. Let's walk and move forward. And you know, Tony Scarpino is a, a good friend is, of mine as well, but I would tell you that one of the issues I had as being chairman of the Black Democrats of Westchester was a concern about the diversity in the office. Because if I go on his webpage right now, there's no people of color on there at all, right? And that's not, that's not reflective of our community. And Tony's a friend, so you can say that to a friend and say, hmm, how do we work through those issues? And again, if the community feels that same way, we gotta work together and show that kind of leadership, and that's not, that's not easy to do, is to sit down with leaders and say, how do we address these problems? How do we address these issues? How do we make sure that everyone feels that when justice is done, or when prosecutions happen, that the rules are the same for everyone. And again, that conversation is not an easy conversation to have. I was you know, blessed to be able to have that because of the two-sided role, because I'm part of the family, because my dad was a cop, and as a human rights activist, it said accountability needs to occur. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm gonna move on to a question pertaining to education. Uh, would you support, and why would you support, uh, having a large West Desert Community College extension here in Peekskill? We'll start with uh, Mr. Jenkins. Well, one is, first of all, I think that we should have, uh, Westchester Community College is a jewel of Westchester. It is something that we do not highlight enough. Yes, the county has to put in X amount of dollars, and it's a minimum investment that we have to put in every year. But Westchester Community College, for a very long time, was rated one of the best community colleges in the country, right? And we don't let folks know that enough. So when we have the extension centers, it helps us two ways. One, it helps us reinvest in certain communities, specifically in their downtowns. So when that happened in Mount Vernon, or whether that happened in Austin, that we were able to make sure to increase investment and things happen around it. So things get built around it, other stores happen, and then we make sure our transportation network works around it and make sure that it works together. And we have this great opportunity to reinvest in individuals. They have an opportunity to help themselves, right? Because as the world changes and their skill set changes and the requirements for those skill sets change, that they have a place that they could go locally in the community and not have to go hither and fro to be able to help enhance their skills, to be able to lift themselves up and do whatever things they would like to do. And whether that's learn a new trade or learn a new skill, we need to continue to do that. So it's putting money and working with investment and in increasing um, our, our centers, whether it's, again, here in Peekskill or anywhere else, I don't think you're going to hear a disagreement from either one of us on this particular thing. But I understand in the fights that we had to do, whether it was in Yonkers, when they were moving out of the, the building that they were, were in and moving to a different space, that you need a government, you need the county government to do the real estate part and let the education side, let the community college do education because they, they got a really bad deal in the in, in a Cross County Center that we had to reverse so we were able to move forward. When they did the extension in Mount Vernon, they kind of put in the wrong size stoves, which cost a million dollars for us to fix. So we need to work through those things, even in peak scale. Okay, Mr. Latimer. Yep. I want you to make clap for Ken first before I talk. <laughs> 
Thanks. You deserve the applause you deserve. You know? uh, yeah, and I would certainly support a robust campus in Peekskill. May I say I support one in Port Chester. I saw my friends Greg and Hattie Adams just walk in, so I wanted in Port Chester too, but I wanted in Peekskill. And, and not just because we want to spread the pork around. Um, I was in Mount Vernon uh, this week a number of times, and, and I went by that area just around Hartley Park where the uh, Westchester Community College Extension is in Mount Vernon on Gramerton Avenue. I grew up in that town, and I spent my time all up and down those streets, and there used to be a Sears and a parking lot that is now the Westchester uh, uh, Community College uh, local center. And you realize when you bring the facilities physically close to people, who need the educational uplift, you get a better chance of them taking advantage of the services. It's a gorgeous campus in Greenberg. It serves a tremendous purpose. They've added services and facilities there. That's a good thing to do. But you need to make it accessible in as many places as you can. The Mount Vernon Initiative, the Yonkers Initiative, should be matched by initiatives in other communities. And certainly, because Peekskill is a major urban center that sits far away from most of the rest of the urban centers of Westchester County. And, and there's a tendency when you're down on that Mount Vernon, White Plains, New Rochelle, Yonkers uh, triangle to forget that Peekskill is everything like those th four communities, but it sits up 25 to 30 miles away. So there's definitely a rationale to do it. Let me add one more thing within the last 36 seconds. This county executive has made it a point of treating the community college as if it was something under his thumb. Uh, and this is not related to peak skill, but it's related to the way you look at the community college. I believe in that college having greater independence to make the decisions that would best serve the people. They have negotiated a union contract between management and labor that is fair, and it involves fair wage increases, and it is budgeted to be paid for, and the county executive will not release that to uh, res resolution because he has other issues dealing with the workforce, all terrible issues. I would, as early as I could, release that, make sure it's signed into law, make sure those union individuals are taken care of as they should be, and send a message to the rest of the workforce that we're going to treat you like normal human beings, not like cannon fodder and some ideological warfare that's going on. Okay. Let me move on to another question, which has to do with, um, it's, again, it's education. How do you plan on helping Westchester County get the founda foundation aid owed to public education by the state? Peekskill alone is owed between seven and 14 million. That is information that was given to me. I am not saying it's accurate. Um, how would you plan to do that? And we will start with Mr. Latimer. Well, I'm currently <clears throat> the Senate uh, major uh, minority member on the Education Committee. So the education issues are my portfolio within the Senate Democratic minority uh, under leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins. The uh, Campaign for Fiscal Equity lawsuit has been ignored by the state, which would represent a reallocation of money to New York City, but by uh, extension, all of the urban need districts around the state. Peekskill is one of them, but it's not the only one. Mount Vernon, Yonkers, the ones I've just mentioned, and, and districts like that all across the state. And not at the expense of other school districts, but the state has to put more money behind public education. It's as simple as that. Why is that? Because if you don't educate, you will wind up incarcerating. If you don't educate, you will wind up having people without proper knowledge who won't have proper health care. And they'll be sicker at an earlier age in their life and cost you more money in Medicaid and Medicare than is necessary. Everything tells you that education is the greatest preventive medicine in every other area of public policy. So uh, the, the role of a county executive, certainly every year we put together a legislative agenda uh, between the executive and the legislature. We prioritize that. We don't have a direct role to play, but I think we speak out on those issues. Uh, we make that part of our education, uh, pardon me, our legislative executive joint package and lobby. And by the way, we support the state legislators that we have right now who are speaking up on these issues. You have people uh, in our delegation right now, like Shelley Mayer, Gary Pretlow, Amy Paul, and David Buckwald, Steve Otis, I'm going to miss somebody, Sandy Galef, um, uh, others, uh, Tom Abenanti, uh, and Andre Stewart Cousins, who are already speaking up on these issues. And sometimes the county government says very little. You know, they'd much rather have a battle. I think, you know, uh, Rob Astorino would much rather go to war with Albany. He wants to go to war with Washington when President Obama is president. Now that Trump is president, uh, the war seems to be over. But uh, the bottom line is that, you know, the county, even in areas where it doesn't have direct authority, has to stand behind people who are pushing good public policy. And in most cases, those are the democratic philosophies that we agree with. 
Okay, thank you. And you're not going to see much daylight on this um, difference between the two of us because one, if, when the foundation aid issue came to the Board of Legislators, we supported the communities fighting for foundation aid because it makes sense in our holistic view of county government. As was stated, you know what, when you have people that are better educated, then there's less likely to be incarcerated. Not impossible, but less likely, and certainly less on social services, et cetera. Those are all impacts to the county. And we do have a legislative package, and foundation aid was part of our conversation with that and supporting our state delegation, who's been doing a tremendous job in trying to make sure that that happens. But the bottom line is we just need more money um, to, to have that happen. And that gets back to you know the issues we have in Westchester County, which talks about where our funding comes from and how unfunded mandates take up dollars and don't, um, they allow us to do things differently. So 99% of our tax dollars are taken up by unfunded mandates. Um, and I just wanted to, to clarify with something in Mount Vernon, the center used to be at that series, but we closed that about three years ago and opened at 15 South Fifth Avenue. And I knew that because I used to work at 15 South Fifth Avenue in New York Telephone and for, for all of my friends from the Beach Shopping Center when I used to work there as well many, many moons ago when it was New York Telephone, I know I'm dating myself, right? So. I, 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 I never worked for Verizon, but at the end of the day, right, from that foundation, aid, <laughs> for that foundation aid and those kind of things, we need to have our county government standing behind the, the local municipalities and the school boards specifically because it's essential for that holistic view for Westchester County. But the only way that happens, by the way, is if there's more dollars that happen from Albany. And we always want to have uh, additional dollars from our federal and state partners. But if that, we don't have that investment, things aren't gonna move forward. And when we don't talk together as a community, when we don't speak as one Westchester, those are problems as well. Our state delegation has spoken with that one voice. We need to make sure that we have our county executive working with the Board of Legislators, making sure that that's a priority as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me ask this question, which deals with economics. How do you plan to close Indian Point safely, deal with layoffs of local workers, and the loss of tax support for the, for the local families and the communities. And we will start with Mr. Jenkins. Well, Indian Point is closing because of a decision because of, by Entergy. That's the first thing. So they made a decision already to, to close the plant, and it was with an agreement with the, uh, the governor, and that's how it was announced. Now, we would make sure that we were showing leadership from the county in providing and creating a task force, which was made up of all the applicable county departments that are necessary to help support the transition and things that are going on. We would be a voice at the table and uh, the coordinator, the quarterback for the team, as we need to make sure that there's some significant issues, whether it's the $30 million in the school district or whether it's just the $5 million that will impact Westchester County eventually. We also need to remember it's still Entergy's property, right? So we can't just wave a magic wand and say, this is what you will do on your property, right? And we have this little nasty organization in the federal government that's gonna decommission the plan. So we need to be a partner in understanding with our local communities and fighting and standing up for all the concerns that are necessary. That would be first. The second thing that we would need to do is make sure that in those transitions, because about 500 of the people would be eligible for retirement according to the energy figures, that means there's a significant amount of people that either are gonna go to another energy facility somewhere in the country, or they're going to be looking for different types of employment. And whether that's at a new type of facility that might is yet to be seen at the plant, or in some other energy related entity. Um, an entity, entity. We need to make sure that the county is not creating fake false lawsuits, which they do not have the ability to do, the county executive does not have the ability to do, and try to give people an opportunity to make sure that their voices are heard. And the county executive and our county needs to be doing that. And as county executive, I will make sure that we are leading that effort and coordinating those efforts throughout all communities. 
Well, I think the first thing that uh, has to be done, and, and it will be done if you have uh, a new county executive, is you stop the war with Albany, and particularly in this case, the war with the governor. Rob Astorino is so fixed on running for governor that uh, he can't look at this issue as a policy issue. He w looks at it as another opportunity to go after Governor Cuomo. Now, uh, in order for us to do the things we need to do, we need cooperative support from the state and from the governor and the legislature. So starting a war with somebody like that is foolish, and it shows you what you put in priority. Do you put your political needs in priority, or do you put the needs of the county that you're supposed to be administering in priority? And as Ken pointed out, uh, a lawsuit on uh, environmental CEQA grounds does not re will not make the plant open, reopen with, more, with the jobs and the money back again. All it does is change the process at best. And it's a symbol to say, well, we don't want the plant to close. That's what he said. But as Ken pointed out, Entergy made a business decision based on the amount of investment that that plant needed to modernize it. It's a 55-year-old plant. And, uh, I mean, I'm 63 years old. I'm starting to break down. I can't imagine <laughs> how a 55-year-old plant is starting to break down. <laughs> but uh, the, the punchline here is that I, want, I took the, uh, um, the initiative to go into New York City and meet with Jim Slevin, who's the head of uh, the Utility Workers Union, UWUA Local 1-2. I met with Lou Picani, who has the second largest group of people, Teamsters Local 456. In those meetings, we discussed the very issue of how do we find new opportunities for these people. I mentioned, with a few seconds left, that the Teamsters who are on site handle high-level security, and they are more than capable of being repurposed into productive jobs securing other area facilities in New York's in New York metropolitan area, UN, you name it, the place that they could do, ballparks and arenas and so forth. So I think instead of launching a fake lawsuit, that that's what a county executive does and comes up with ways to do exactly what Ken and I both agree, which is deal with the aftermath of a decision that was made by a business and by the state government. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next question will be, what is your position on privatization of Westchester County Airport? Start with Mr. Latimer. One of the worst public policy ideas that I have ever seen in my 63 years of living. You have an asset that is not distressed, that is performing its function well, that is functionally a private-public partnership already and you look at it and you see dollar signs. It's like a piggy bank, and you're trying to figure out how do I get into that piggy bank so I can get some of the money. Do you get some of the money because you happen to have a unique deficit that has to be closed? No, because you have a political position that you've taken, and you realize now you've taken all the low-hanging fruit that you can take, and now you have to do one-shot deals, bad public policy to try to get revenue from wherever you can find it, so you crack open that piggy bank. You ignore the Board of Legislators as, as an equal, co-equal branch of government, and you should turn to the Board of Legislators and say, set the parameters for whatever kind of a public partnership we should look at generically in the future. That should be a matter of legislation. And then we, the executive branch, will look at those opportunities and come back to you. No, we're going to load a gun, point it to your head, and tell you if you don't do this, it's going to cost you $15 million in the budget. So I stand by that statement. And if I am the uh, winner of the Democratic primary, I can't wait to go after Rob Astorino on that issue. I think he's vulnerable as could be on it, and I think he's done it strictly as a money grab and strictly as a short-term benefit. He plans to either be in the governorship or on Fox News by the time that thing becomes a big, big problem. I'm betting Fox News. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> but the upshot of it, and I'm not trying to be snotty or snide, but this is a, you know, this is, a, this is an awful public policy. You're, you're selling off the future to satisfy the immediate. It's like hocking something that you inherited from your grandparents for a couple of bucks because this right now you want to do. And, and, and it's not because he's stupid. He's a smart man. He's doing this willfully. This is his philosophy of government. And this is what you have to wake up the Democratic base. If Ken's the nominee or I'm the nominee, you've got to wake people up. Let them know what it is this man is doing and stop it and stop it right now. Okay. All right. 
Mr. Jenkins. My position on the airport has been from the very beginning that we shouldn't be going forward with an RFP. Um, the process for the county executive and, and when I'm county executive and, and with Georgia's county executive, we would hope to do the same things as far as making proposals to the Board of Legislators. That's not an issue. Doing it last minute and making it part of the budget process should never have happened. Right? But that happened because two Democrats voted along with that budget that had $15 million in it. Right? And until we get to that place where we understand that um, sometimes we enable people right? and we allow bad habits to take place, it is an absolute bad, bad deal among all the bad deals that Rob Astorino has proposed to think about selling off the airport. The airport is not a privatization deal. It's already privatized. It has three county employees in it, and it is run by a company on behalf of the county. So it's already privatized. As it was said, it's just a money grab. As Joyce said, it was a money grab, trying to get $15 million and then five, year, $5 million for four years and then $2 million a year after that. So if we do nothing at the airport, zero, nothing, we'd make $100 million more than this proposal that was put in front of us. There is no reason that we should be even considering it. And as soon as we get the delayed airport master plan, that would be that roadmap. It's three years overdue. The Board of Legislators as a whole have been asking for that for many, many years, saying we need to see an airport master plan that the Board of Legislators approves. Then you might go out and get an RFP to go out and see what things you might want to do, and then the legislators could consider it. But the way that this Astorino approach is, and quite frankly, some of my colleagues that have supported and enabled that by allowing those dollars to be in the budget, because guess what? At the end of this year, if there's no airport deal, and it's not going to be an airport deal this year, there's going to be a $15 million shortfall, in addition to all the other liabilities we have. So no airport deal until we have a master plan. Thank you. Let me take this opportunity to ask this question right here, and we're going to be wrapping up soon, but let me ask this question. As the world witnessed in Charlottesville, Virginia, earlier this summer, sadly, hatred, intolerance, and bias continues to fester in our nation. We need to stop the bigotry, prejudice, and hatred once and for all. What steps as county executive would you take to ensure that we move in the direction of stopping this, these heinous acts. We will start with uh, Mr. Jenkins. Well, one, as a NACP president, what I used to say all the time is that you can't change uh, the NACP and the policies and laws that have been enacted don't change what's in your heart. The only thing it does is it, make it, it makes it really expensive when you articulate those things. So the issue for us in our country right now is facing up to the, the, the problems that we have as far as race are concerned and having that open and honest dialogue, then we could come up with some real solutions. The problem for us is that first we need to take that first step. In our world right now, and because of number 45, we have a scenario where people think it's okay to walk around with torches in their hand and not have a mask on. They think it's okay to do that. It's not okay to do that. It's not right to do that. And people of goodwill all over need to stand up and denounce that. That's another part of the step that has to happen. We have to have that conversation and say, this is not right. We should not have this at all. We wouldn't have got to the Saturday Charlottesville item if I was in charge in that kind of area, because as soon as people started walking around acting like they were Ku Klux Klansmen, we would not have had any, we wouldn't have had a Saturday, right? Well, we would have had shut that down. And yeah, we might have had to go to court and had another fight about it, but guess what? We would not have had that happen. And in Westchester County, we need to stand up and have all those kind of conversations, and that's why we need to reinstitute a real Human Rights Commission. We might not fire everybody because a good friend, Jerese Duckett Epps, who serves in the Human Rights Commission, she ran for judge for us. So we don't want to fire just everybody, but we would absolutely almost make sure, everybody, almost everybody, right, to do that to make sure that we have a people that really know that. Our Human Rights Commission is here to start those conversations and with partnerships with all of the organizations that we have that are human rights and civil rights advocates to make a difference. Thank you. Mr. Latimer. Well, Ken outlined the governmental step, uh, which we both talked about already. The Human Rights Commission was created not only to adjudicate 
certain cases, but also for public education. When it doesn't perform its function, there are no sessions and seminars coming out of the county that bring people together across the, the different demographics that divide us. Uh, and, and that's what has to happen. It has to be robust. It has to be countywide in its scope, not just in parts of the county, but everywhere in the county. And, uh, and that clearly is an immediate step. And as a county executive, he should have been out there when they had the vigil in Tarrytown, Sleepy Hollow. Should have been out there for the vigil in Peekskill or the vigil in Katona, the village, the vigil in New Rochelle and all these other places. Stand with, don't worry about partisan politics. Stand with your fellow man and make a statement. Stand there and hold a candle like many of us did. I did it three or four places, not all of them, to show solidarity with this. But let me say this. As a white man, it's time for white men to speak up and say, we don't believe in this type of white supremacy BS. We reject it. Just like men have to stand up and say, we don't believe in domestic violence, men against women. And we Christians have to stand up and say, we're not going to tolerate somebody talking about Jews must go. It's the people who are part of the majority groups that have to stand up and tell those people from those majority groups, you're wrong. You're not talking anything that Jesus Christ said if you're a Christian. You got to take that name out of your, out of your belief set. And, and, and we don't judge people by the color of their skin, as Martin Luther King said, but by the content of their heart. And when I get a county executive that stands up and says that the day after Charlottesville, then I think I've got the right county executive. I didn't get that. I got a guy who said, you made a little statement about three days later, and he said other things on the radio. Went along with Trump when he insulted Mika Brzezinski, uh, you know, kind of made excuses for different things that happened. You need a county executive, regardless of his legal authority, to set a moral tone. And, and that moral tone is said clearly, and everybody understands that's who's leading your county government. Okay. All right, gentlemen, we have one last question, and that question is, what do you consider to be the most critical issue facing Westchester County? And if elected, what are your top three priorities? Please stick within the two minutes. We will start <laughs> with Mr. Latimer. I guess I got to talk about that guy in the American Spectrum. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, as quickly as I can, the single biggest problem that I see uh, you look outside, it's a sunny day. We hear that uh, Hurricane Irma may come our way at some point in time with rain, but it doesn't look like it right now. But you know it's coming. You look outside right now, you don't see the fiscal crisis that's coming to Westchester County. People are walking around saying, lower my taxes, like they said to me this morning. They don't realize this borrowing, this going into the reserve funds, this not negotiating with the union, this is a hurricane financial coming. It's going to turn into Nassau County, what Yonkers went with 30 years ago, New York City. It's going to hit us like a freight train, and being in Fox News is your plan. You plan to pull the ripcord, and you won't be here when this happens. That, to me, is, is the four-year challenge for the next administration to do as much as you can to anticipate and mitigate this crisis that that's coming. Top three priorities, very simple. Straighten out the fiscal mess that Rob Astorino has created. Take us off of this ideological standard that we're on that allows him to, you know, veto the uh, Immigrant Protection Act and, and call vindication and HUD and go to a pragmatic standard. Pragmatic standards, do the housing, stop fighting about it. And then the third thing is open up this government. Stop all of these private deals behind the scenes, board of acquisition and contract, deals that are going down that nobody can uh, alter. Open it up. Make the Board of Legislators your partner in government, even when you disagree. And open it up to people so they see what's actually going on in the government. I did that in the Board of Legislators 20 years ago when I first became chairman. We put ourselves on cable TV. We opened ourselves out to the community. It's been advanced since then. But the bottom line is we were the first legislature to put night meetings and things that said, listen, you're the people. You voted for us. You have a role to play in watching and seeing what we've done. That's the exact same process that has to happen within the executive branch. And that's exactly what I tend to do if I'm county executive. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Jenkins. Thank you. Um, the first thing that, from a priority perspective, it starts with employment and jobs. So once you have employment and jobs, and how we do that in Westchester County is by investing the $1.8 billion that we have in our county budget, the $1.5 billion that we have in capital projects, and we utilize that to make sure that we're getting jobs for people around Westchester County because yeah, that's the first thing people are concerned with. The, the second issue um, starts with 
the not the tax portion of it, because one of the things that I'm able to do is able to battle Rob Astorino on that because I doubled his tax relief, put money into his not-for-profit partners, and saved hundreds of union jobs. So we know we can do that inside the dollars that we have. But to make sure that we are appropriately invested in those particular departments, that means we're going to shift the dollars around that we have. From a priority perspective, my number one priority is to take 10% of what we spend in corrections right now and spend that in our youth. That number, by the way, that number, by the way, would be about $40 million. And that $40 million would be able to be utilized whether it was in for, um, for conflict resolution or mental health services, because that's where it would go under, but it would be for conflict resolution. It would help us to do things in making sure that people got early childhood education, making sure that their child care centers were fully and appropriately funded, and making sure, more importantly, that we learn how to respect each other instead of fighting each other, depending on those kind of things. And in my last 30 seconds, I want to say one thing. That's part of the process that we've been going through. I hope that what we've been doing for the last six months, or the last six months altogether, and all the conversations that we have are showing people how you can have a discussion and debate about issues, not be personal about it, and making sure that leadership and differences don't mean nasty and divisive. We can make sure that at the end of the day, Westchester County can be the best county in the United States that it used to be. It used to be looked at as a model. Now it's not looked at the same way. So we need to work together to do that. But again, that number one priority, I'll be successful, is if we spend that $40 million on our youth. Thank you. OK, gentlemen, just one last question or comment that you can make. This is really a comment. Um, and please, when this time you only have one minute. Please say why. Most of you, you, both of you seem rather similar in many things or have indicated similarity and beliefs in many things. So why should they vote for you? Start with Mr. Latimer. I've been asked this question a lot of times and I refrain from answering it. I don't think there's a question of better. I think it's a question that you have to answer in your own mind. You have two people who have expressed their point of view. We have similar beliefs. We have some similarities in our experiences. We have some differences in our life experience. I have electoral experience that involves running for the New York State Senate three times successfully against huge Republican odds in a district that was carved for the Republicans. I have fought through running in places like North Castle and Bedford and Eastchester and Tucker. I've been on the ballot, and I've won in many of those places. And at the end of the day, you have to consider who's going to beat Rob Astorino, because winning at the end of this day is very important. Otherwise, we don't change a, d a bit of public policy. But I would, all, I would say the most important thing is you've got to vote. Whether you vote for me, if you vote for Ken, you've got to come out and vote. And then you have to tell people to vote in the primary, and you've got to get those people out in November. Democrats are overwhelmingly the majority of this county, and they overwhelmingly stay home in an odd-numbered year election. You're going to have lousy public policy if you and your friends don't come out and vote. And I think that at the end of the day, when we talk through this particular scenario, the reason, um, as we talked about, is the difference of experience. And part of that difference of experience is what understanding happens in our county every day. I've lived with Rob Astorino from day one. I can talk to and match up because my plan is the one that does not raise taxes. My plan is the one that only talks about investing in our communities. And we work together and talk about the real results that we've been able to deliver. And we're, we're talking the same thing as far as saying we need you to go out and evaluate our records and see what things that we can do and what things we can bring to the community, the things that we've led. At the end of the day, we need everyone to come out to vote on not only September 12th, but on November 7th. The, the game is changed now. We have to change the game. We can't do the same things that we used to do. Whether we did it in 2009 or we did it in 2013, if we do the same thing and expect a different result, that's not how we change things. We have a set of folks right now that have sat on the sidelines and far too long they've been ignored. This is an opportunity for you to make sure your voices are heard. In September 12th, we hope that you come out and you vote. And I hope you vote for me, but if you don't, at least you vote for someone, right? But please come out on September 12th, right? right? Vote for George. Right? Vote for George, right? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank the audience for your cooperation.
Uh, don't leave yet. The civic engagement chairperson has something he wants to say to you. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day. And I know you vote. The important thing is you get somebody else to vote. Thank you all. It's on, wait. Um, Mike's not on. Um, all right, I'll just speak up. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming out today. Thank the candidates for uh, being here. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to also thank the, the previous session um, of candidates that um, that came out. But um, uh, so with that, I, I want to thank, thank Jennifer Brown, who's the library director, uh, allowed us to use this space. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Wilbur Aldridge for a wonderful job in my yes. I want to uh, just mention there's a group of people in this room who helped put this together. Madeline, my co-chair, um, sitting right here. Laura Myers, Myerson, and Susan Daines in the back, and uh, another uh, wonderful person, Janice, who helped us out today in the back. So. <laughs> Remember, we have the handouts in the back, and I see Jessica and then Laura, uh, the five questions that these candidates um, um, supplied to us. Um, and I just want to end with the quote that I started with uh, this morning from Martin Luther King. And it says, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Voting matters because each of us matters. So go out and vote. And thank you all for coming.